We are the boys and you're listening to the sound stage. There's only one fucking China. One fucking China. Yeah, I, I met John at art college back in Leeds. And, uh, uh, we, uh, I decided to go down to London and John said, you had a guitar, didn't you? An acoustic guitar and you sold it to, to you know, join me. We hitchhiked down to London. And, uh, I, I wasn't intending to stay there too long. I just wanted to check it out, but uh, ended up staying there forever. Same with John. Well, my name's Matt. <laughs> Yeah, my name's John and I came down with Matt. <laughs> down to London, we stuck down there. He stayed a bit longer. I, I, I was missing my girlfriend at the time, so I went back again and then I, then I started missing Matt. <clears throat> so I hitched up down again and then stayed with Matt and then we went to a T-shirt printing. No, we didn't. We went to a famous fashion designer and started doing so fabric printing. Yeah. You know, and uh, actually, then I started working for Zandra Rhodes and printed Bianca Jagger's wedding dress. And I was there for the fitting. That was nice. What? Yes. Yeah. It was only oh, fitting yeah. that you'd be And this is before fitting. the boys, yeah. So I was very, very famous before the boys, and then as soon as the boys started, I wasn't famous anymore. Is it an unsung, uh, what, what would you call it? Mm. Dressmaker. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah, Who are I'm, you? Uh, I'm uh, Cassiano Steele, and I uh, moved to London in 1970 and started a band called The Hollywood Brats, which was uh, a little bit too early for its own good. And uh, when we split up, I met these guys and we started The Boys. I discovered uh, uh, Velvet Underground now, it was around uh, some girl's house, and she said, I got this really horrible record that somebody sent me from New York and, uh, and I said uh, and she said she used it when when guests overstayed she put this record on so they would go and, uh, and I said let me hear it you know and uh, I heard it and I loved it you know I went out and bought it on import you know the next day almost you know so that was my first taste of New York if you like my first introduction to to uh, punk rock was, uh, I think, uh, Jerry Lee Lewis live at the Star Club Hamburg, early 60s. Uh, and that, that was fantastic, and that's as much punk rock as anything, as far as I'm concerned. My introduction to punk rock was Morecambe and Wise singing You're My Sunshine. <laughs> <laughs> Check it out. If that ain't punk rock, nothing is. <laughs> Don't you agree, Cass? I agree, totally. Yeah. I've always been into rock and roll, and Jerry Lee Lewis is 100% rock and roll. He sums up the whole thing rock and roll is all about. And that's it. He is the king, without any doubt. Elvis was great, Elvis was the king of popular music. Chuck Berry was the king of songwriting, but Jerry Lee Lewis was the king of rock and roll. Amen. Amen. Britain in the mid 70s was very depressed. Uh, you know, uh, uh, there was no jobs for kids. Uh, you know, not that we minded because we were musicians, and to, the best thing that could happen to you was uh, you you could sign on the dole and then carry on making music. You know, so it was like a, a, a free apprenticeship paid for by the government. But uh, but generally speaking, uh, opportunities were very. Uh, limited for, for young people leaving school, job-wise. You know, it was like working a factory or, you know, doing some shit job. And, uh, yeah, no, no, so I think, uh, I think that not just kids, I think everybody was depressed in the 70s. And it was a, it was grey, kind of, almost like, I was gonna say communist, uh, Russia or something, but uh, not at all like China. Uh, <laughs> You know, I wasn't but, depressed. <laughs> no, we weren't depressed. Like I say, we we because we, we we appreciated being on the dole and not having to work. And uh, you know, and uh, three day week. Exactly. Brilliant. Yeah, this three day week. It was uh, it was depressed times. 
So yeah, there was there was, and in music, you know, because the music was kind of stagnant at that time. So you know, it was just this you know prog rock, and, uh, funky shit. That, so uh, you know that that's where these musicians came out of. Out, out the way, you know, musicians who weren't very good musicians. You know, I know who just wanted to play basic rock and roll, and it opened up a whole new opportunity for a lot of kids. Even the punks benefit from the the, the punk the explosion, if you like. Cause it was very quick. Uh, you know, like uh, I remember punks. There was media coming from all over the world to London, and punks used to charge like a Japanese photographer fifty quid to take their photo. You know, and, uh, and, or an Italian, uh, you know, journalist to ask them some questions. You know, so the the punks even if they weren't musicians, were enjoying it. It was a great time. You know? And it turned the music business on his head as well. Yeah. They were fab guys. They were, they were, I, can, I think I can say for, for three of us, they were probably... If we ever had any heroes, you know, they, they were our heroes. You know, we, we loved them as... First, first album we heard inspired us to sort of do stuff. But they were, at the time, sort of like uh, trying to clean up because they were heavily into certain substances. So when they were on tour with us, they they were completely dry and they were, and as far as I'm concerned, boring as fuck, you know. <laughs> they played the gig, they went back to the hotel and they went to bed, apart from Marky, who always used to come down, you know, to the bar where we were in the hotel and just said, don't tell the guys, because <laughs> even he, he just wanted a beer, you know, and like, they, it, but he couldn't because if the rest of the band were. And they didn't even know how to play their fucking hit that they had in the top ten. So we had to show them how to play their Baby I Love You because they had to start playing it halfway through the tour because people were shouting it out for it. Yeah, that was the Phil Spector album, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, it was all strings. It was all session musicians. Yeah. There's no guitar on that song. I think the only person who actually played on it was uh, Joey. You know, uh, the... the the rest, it was all done by session musicians. So we were, me and Matt were in the dressing room teaching Johnny how to play Baby I Love You. And I said, it goes from E to C sharp minor. And he goes, minor? What's a minor? He'd been, they'd, they'd, they'd been playing songs for, I don't know how many, how many fucking years, and like there's lots of minor chords in, in their songs, but they, they didn't know how to play minors because they only hit the first three strings. They were fantastic people, you know, but boy, were they dumb, you know. Yeah. And they, were, they weren't really talking to each other as well when we were Yeah, so, it was a so, horrible atmosphere. So they were, we were friends with all of them, but they yeah. weren't friends with each other, so it was a, not a yeah, brilliant but, attitude. Was, and our, our roadie, uh, Mark Mason, was uh, had an arrangement with, with Marky, because they all had sort of like cycling bottles with straws out to drink, but it was just water for everybody on stage, taped to the microphones, and Marky got our roadie to sort of like put in vodka and orange in his. But one night, they got mixed up and Johnny got the vodka and orange. And uh, they went fucking mental, you know. And uh, I think that's why Marky got the first sack after the tour. Maybe. Yeah, that's what I heard. That's what Marky told me when I saw him in London. Okay. But, you know, at that time also, they hated each other, you know, Joey and Johnny, because of Linda, you know. There was uh, there was a girl involved, and as it always is. But um, uh, it, it was great. Uh, the concerts were great, and it was great being on stage with them. Yeah. But it was not great the rest of the day, you know. John Peel was great for punk because that that was the the first uh, punk exposure was on the John Peel show. You know, so God bless him. I mean, he, he liked all sorts of music, you know, from African drum music and Polish folk or whatever, but he picked up on punk. And so, you know, and so that, that was the... I mean, some of the best, the best punk uh, stuff that was done at the BBC is because of him, you know. So many punk bands did the Peel Sessions, you know, and we actually did, uh, instead of TCP, it was BBC. <coughs> please play our records, please, you know. He was a good lad. He was a Radio 1 DJ, but he, he had a, a 
quite a late night program where he played kind of alternative music, it, although it wasn't cold at the time. He just played obscure music. And, uh, but the, whereas the rest of the BBC and the old commercial radio stations were just playing the, the top 20 or, you know, so, uh, so that was the show that where you, I, I, I wasn't, I never listened to it. I don't know if you guys, not really. No. But, it, but we I was first got then. played on the radio uh, on the John Peel show. So, you know, God bless him, you know. Because I remember saying, I think it must have been, what was it, about 1978, I, I made a quote saying, I can't see the use of a computer in the modern day home. I was a little bit wrong there. But I think they're very lucky people that they can go on to Spotify and check everybody out and then they can download for nothing. And it's great for everybody else but the people who were fucking playing the songs because they don't get any money. So uh, apart from that, I'm not bitter. But I just wish it was like the old days. Sorry. Well, when you went into the shop and you bought the album, you know, and the band got... You read the cover. Loved the cover, used it for rolling a joint, you know, and <laughs> listened to the stuff. And you got paid. The band got paid. The bands don't get paid anymore. Unless you're the Stones, you know. So, yeah, I'm all in favour of this modern-day age. Not. Well, I don't think young people know who plays in the band. I don't, they don't know the bands. They know the song. And uh, it's a song, and OK, it's a nice song, and it sells well, and, yeah, yeah, we like that artist, you know. But it doesn't stand for anything. It doesn't mean anything. It's, a, it's the same with football. You know, we had great footballers in the old days. These days, you have you know, fashion guys, you know, just, it's pathetic. Rich fucking wankers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, and, we, and we were listening to vinyl, you know, when you got a vinyl record. It, it was expensive. And you, but you read the label, and you looked at who produced it, and who wrote the song. And, flipped it over and, you know, kids today don't, you know, they just, you know, listen to it on the internet or download it and, and there's no information, you know. So it, it was different then. You, if you were into music, you, you, you knew everything about this and you, you searched, you know, there was, there was no internet, of course, so you, so you kind of, you know, used these magazines like Enemy, Melody Maker, where you you know, you look forward to it coming out every week because you, you, just for a little snippet of news about a band you like. You know? So it's, it's different times. You know? New Musical Express and especially the Melody Maker at that time was um, like the Bible for us because they, uh, everyone advertised in the Melody Maker and, uh, you know, uh, auditions, uh, uh, searching for uh, guitar players and bass players and drummers and all that. And, uh, you know, at that time everyone went to auditions all the time. But you usually ended up uh, in auditions with a bunch of hippies, you know? And, uh, and when you met someone who were into rock and roll, then, you know, we've got something, let's do something, you know? None of us thought it would last this long. You know, we thought we'd be, you know, it's like uh, the music of the 60s or the, uh, you know, it, it couldn't last forever. And music always went in cycles, you know. So we we didn't think we'd be playing this stuff. We thought we had maybe five, six years of you know uh, success, if you like. I mean, you know, like we would never eat in anarchy or anything like that. Me and Cass, after a gig, all we wanted to do was go back to the hotel and put our feet and have a nice cognac. You know, we didn't we didn't have a message, did we? Not really. <laughs> a massage. <laughs> Occasional massage, but no message. But you know, like we were main, mainly, the difference between us and a lot of the others were that we were mainly songwriters. We wrote tunes, you know, and we were happy with what we wrote. And we were hoping that in, uh, in 30, 40 years, maybe someone would do a cover version or someone would make a hit out of our, some of our songs or something. Because we, we believed in our songs, uh, you know, as, uh, handicraft or whatever, you know, like okay. uh, 
Yeah. So it was a, a bit different. And we still believe in our yeah, songs. Yeah, yeah. And to be honest, we, we, did, uh, we did get... I mean, the reason we went to, one of the reasons we went to Japan or reformed to, to play Japan was that the, the Japanese punk band had covered a couple of our songs. And so suddenly our records were selling. What was it? M Michelle Gun Elephant? Michelle Gun Elephant, yeah. yeah. The Michelle Gun Elephant, which uh, is, it was the Japanese trying to say machine gun etiquette. Yeah. 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 So, but, uh, so suddenly they brought attention to us. And the first, uh, <coughs> Gold record we got was for uh, Die Toten Hosen in Germany, uh, did two of our songs, and we got our first gold record. You know, this is, you know, 20 years after it had been released, and we thought bye bye. That's the, you know, so it was like sowing little seeds, you know. They, Just the gold them, record though, no money. <laughs> no, it's not even made of gold. I don't know, after, uh, <laughs> after China and all, we got. We're going to Finland, and uh, we have a support band in Finland called Poyat, which apparently means the boys in Finnish. And they had the number one hit in Finland with uh, a song called uh, Pasi Virtanen or something, which is uh, Jimmy Brown. Uh, what was first? No, Jim was... Jimmy Brown? No. Yeah. No. Yes. No. Okay, but it was. <laughs> and that was number one in Finland, and. Uh, <coughs> You know, they did the Finnish version of it. So that's it. I thought so it was Terminal Love. No, no, it's really, it was Jimmy Brown. Okay. I think the reason why we can still work together is the distance. <laughs> <laughs> we, yeah, yeah. we all live hundreds of miles from each other. <laughs> yeah. You know, so, right. uh, so we don't see each other that often. It's, it's like, in a way, it's like being in a family. Because, you, you know, if you, if you spend too much time with your family, you start falling out. And, uh, and I think that's, that's the same for bands. Cause, uh, like every gig that we do when we get together, it's like, a, like Christmas. You know, like you start off really well and then... Or like Christmas it, or a, a wedding or a funeral. Oh, yeah, or yeah. <laughs> it always ends up really shit. Me, so hating, me hating him and me hating him. Then we, and then and we don't see each other for a few weeks and it's all fine, you know. And me hating him. Yeah. I fucking hate these guys. Yeah. 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 In fact, you know, like, if it, this interview don't end fucking pretty soon, I'm going to kill them both. Keep the cameras rolling for that. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'd, 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 like, to, I'd like the rerun. <laughs> what makes you think you'd be alive? <laughs> <laughs> right, exactly. Oh, yeah, right, yeah. Oh, two against one. 